praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> God seems to know what he's doing, doesn't he? Yes, he does. I mean, that first song that you were singing yes. contains uh, the very seed, I think, of what we're going to be sharing this evening. And so, God is preparing our hearts. I was just thinking, you were singing there, we shall never die. Are you singing a lie or are you singing the truth? The truth. Yeah, you mean you hope so? No, sir. Or you not know so? Amen. I had a man coming around selling insurance for funerals. He asked me, he said, you know, if you passed on, he said, you know, your wife would have a pretty heavy price to pay, you know, to get your bearing and so on. And uh, he said, I got a very good deal for you. I said, you know, I'm really not interested. He said, what, you're not interested? I said, no. I said, I've made no plans to die anyway. <laughs> and he looked at me. I think he thought I was crazy. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Maybe you're just in your right mind. Yes. That's right. That's right. Anyway. Over this weekend, the theme that I uh, will be following is entitled Spiritual Consciousness. It's a word that people don't really understand. And therefore, it's something that may sound new to you, but actually it's not. It's just that you haven't heard that word used very much. But, um, you see, consciousness is a, a very important part of our life. For instance, you're conscious of the weather. You're conscious of the temperature. You're conscious of your surroundings. You're conscious of a lot of things. We call that our consciousness. If somebody came up to me and said, uh, Sir, I'm stuck. Have you got a match? I said, well, I'm a match for any man, but I don't have a match. <laughs> and he said, Oh, why would I say I have no matches? Because I'm not ever conscious of carrying matches with me. See, I don't smoke. There's some fire in here, but there's no smoke. <laughs> so here we are. You see, it's important for us. The things that you are conscious of, you do not have to think about. Isn't that the truth? That's the truth. What you're conscious of, you don't have to stop and, uh, oh, well, wait a minute, let me see. I didn't have to go and say, oh, no, wait a minute, I check all my pockets. No, no, I haven't got a match here. <laughs> I don't have to do that because I am conscious of the fact that I don't carry matches with me. No. So if I said to you tonight, and this is just an introduction, if I said to you tonight, are you a Christian? And you nod your head or say yes. I say, well, um, you know, what do you base the, the, uh, the, the concept that you're a Christian? What do you base that upon? Well, he said, you know, um, I've given my heart to Jesus. Uh, I actually believe that Jesus died for me on the cross. Um, I've asked Christ to come into my life and uh, so I'm a Christian. I said, you know, that's all in your natural consciousness. But it's got nothing to do with your spiritual consciousness. It's I did this, I did that, I did something else, I believe this, I uh, understand that. 
That's your natural consciousness. It's got nothing to do with God. But isn't it amazing how little Christians know about spiritual consciousness? What are you conscious of that is in the realm of spirit? <laughs> Come on. We're going to be talking about this, and I am not preaching at you tonight, and I am putting no demand upon you whatsoever. I'm going to share with you the truth as it's been revealed to me. And you see, I can't preach truth that I've not experienced. Right. Oh, yes. And so, 40 years ago, I made a kind of a deal with God, if you ever can make a deal with God. <laughs> but you know, I said to the Lord, uh, because I just resigned from the ministry, the, uh, from the uh, pastoral ministry, and uh, I had walked out of the church, I said, I'm finished. I wasn't angry with anybody. I wasn't going to fight with anybody. But I just said, I'm finished. <clears throat> and I just opened my workshop, went back to work. For two years, I, first of all, for the first few months, I didn't even read the book. But I said, Father, I am determined that from this day on, I want you to teach me what you want me to know. I said, I've had it being taught by theologians and uh, men with, you know, two or three degrees and, you know, they've got their doctorates and so on. You'd think God was sick with all the doctors in the pulpit today. <laughs> And so I said, God, I want to hear your word yes. from you. Yes. And what you tell me is what is going to now become what I believe. And therefore, that is what I'm going to preach. So I'm sharing this with you tonight. Spiritual consciousness. The children of Israel went out into the wilderness they were in a desert uh, place. Nothing would grow out there. There was no water. There was nothing. So, what happens? Well, they're there for 40 years, you know. And for 40 years, the Bible says, their shoes never wore out. Oh, God help us. They don't make them that good these days. <laughs> And not only that, but for 40 years, their clothes never wore out. Now, that's a bit strange, isn't it? I mean, I haven't got any, I mean, I'm over 40 years old, and I haven't got any shirts that go back beyond 40 years, nor any clothes. They don't last that long. And then, of course, there was the bread that they had every day. The bread was there, the bread from heaven every day and then of course they were short on water in the beginning so God said Moses you see that rock down there you just talk to the rock and the water will come out for you and the water came out of that rock for 40 years Israel was a people of miracle yes. Amen. but none of them saw the miracles. No. Are you hearing this? Amen. None of them saw the miracles. They all died, for goodness sake. Yes. They're eating the bread from heaven, but they're dead. They didn't even make it over the River Jordan. The adults that had started out in the journey. So, this is a strange thing. Why didn't they see the miracles? Why didn't they understand that their clothes were actually miracle clothes? That God was doing something for them. Why didn't they see that water coming out of the rock? And understand that was a miracle. That was God doing that. Why didn't they see all those things? Because you see their consciousness 
was only in the natural. That's all. And I tell you that the majority of Christians today are living in the natural consciousness without any understanding of that which is spiritual that belongs to you. And so we're going to share a little bit about this. And just in the introduction again as we go through this, one day 5,000 people followed Jesus out into the desert. 5,000 people. And when they were a fair way out there, and quite a long way from um, any shops or anything, Jesus said to the disciples, okay, tell them all to sit down and we're going to have lunch. Well, the disciples looked at him for a minute and said, Sir, you know, we don't mean to be uh, rude or anything, but are you sane or are you, you know, are you thinking straight? You've got 5,000 people here. You want a truckload of bread and who knows what not else to feed them. He said, just make the people sit down. And then he said, now what have we got here? And they said, well, all we can find is a little lad's got a lunch here with five little sandwiches and two little fish. He said, that's good. Give it to me. So they gave him the five sandwiches. They gave him the two little fish. He began, began to just deal that fish out into baskets. And he'd say to the disciple, okay, that one's full, take it out. And they watched as he just dealt that bread out, dealt that bread until 5,000 people had eaten to their full. But not one of them saw the miracle. They never saw the miracle. They saw the bread, but they never saw the miracle. Are you listening? Why didn't they see the miracle? Because they didn't even know what they were looking at. They had no idea that Jesus Christ was simply taking what he had and fed 5,000 people. Yeah. There's a little verse I want you to have a look at. Mark it in your Bible if you're not too religious. <laughs> it's in Psalm 145. Psalm 145. And verse 16. And it says here, speaking of the Father that our brother was talking about before, you open your hand and you satisfy the desires of all mankind, of every living thing. Yeah. Did you hear that? God simply has to open his hand and every living thing in the universe is fed. That's God. You see, our mind has to be re reset when we come to understand God. Because our natural thinking cannot contain God. You can't see him with your natural eyes. You can't even hear him with your natural ears. He's unknowable here because God is spirit. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> well, how would God expect you to know him if he is spirit and you are simply mortal? Well, it doesn't work. And that's why most people really do not know God. When I say don't know God, I didn't say you don't know anything about God. Right. You know that God created the heavens and the earth. You know that, don't you? You know that he put the sun, the moon, and the stars up there. You know that, don't you? You know that uh, God has uh, provided for you that back in creation, he said, let us make man, and there was the man. See, we know all that about God. But we don't know God. 
you only know about him. The things that we can understand with our natural mind. Yes, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Oh, God. Turn with me as we just begin this. I'm trying to lay a foundation here tonight. <coughs> Song of uh, not the Song of Solomon. Um, Proverbs, chapter 8. Proverbs, chapter 8. It might be better if you just listen to me because I want to read this in the first person to you. So I want you just to listen, would you? And just take in what's being said here. Because this is going to change your life. I'm going to read from verse 22 if you just want to put it down in your book for a reference. Verse 22. The Lord possessed you in the beginning of his ways. Even before his works of old. You were set up before him from everlasting, from the beginning, even before the earth was created or formed. When there was no depths there, you were there. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills were even brought forth, and while as yet he had not even made the earth, nor the fields, nor the mountains, even when he prepared the heavens, you were there. When he set a compass on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds in the sky, when he strengthened the foundation of the oceans and gave to the sea in his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment when he appointed the foundations of the earth. And then you were by him as a child with his father and you were constantly his delight yes. did you hear that yes. i'm trying to take you beyond your natural consciousness i'm trying to help you to know that you were alive long long time before you were ever born on this earth Amen. Yes. You were alive. God said to Job, where were you when I uh, formed the, uh, or when I put the stars in space? He said, you should know, Job, you were there. And so were you. You were there. You see, this is beyond our natural consciousness, but you've got to get this into your spiritual consciousness. You see, the spiritual consciousness functions in that other world mm -hmm. in the other world right so it's important for us to know what's in that other world because we need to be conscious of it revelation chapter 4 book of revelation chapter 4 <coughs> And after this, oh sorry, we'll go back. Verse 20 of chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. Now, every picture that I have seen that's been drawn and put on the walls of many Christian homes today is a picture of a front door of a house. And Jesus Christ is standing there and he's knocking. 
And the preacher says, Jesus Christ is knocking on your heart's door tonight, and he wants you to let him in. You're too late, sir. He's already there. He's already there. So that's not the picture. I want you to understand tonight when we read this verse, that Jesus Christ is not out there looking in here or trying to get in here. He's already in you. Amen. This is your spiritual consciousness. <laughs> this is something that you have to be so familiar with that just like I said about the matches, you won't even have to think about it. Right. Where is Christ? He point up to the sky? No, no, no. He's in here. You see? This is your spiritual consciousness. So it's not so difficult after all, is it? We're not talking about airy-fairy stuff. We're talking about reality yes. as it is in God. So it says here, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus Christ is not on the outside. He's in here. But I want to tell you, most Christians are not conscious of His presence. Most, most Christians are not conscious of the presence of the Christ. Why? Well, because, you know, uh, we, we have a little problem that rises in our body, and we say, well, uh, you know, we're, I'm going to have to fight this thing. I don't know what it is. And then the doctor comes along and he checks you out and says, Oh, you've got cancer. Oh, my goodness, oh, I've got cancer. What am I going to do now? You see? Because within your natural consciousness, you don't have any answer for that, do you? And many other things that I could quote tonight that come into our lives. We don't have the answer in our natural consciousness. But if you can only understand tonight that Christ dwells in you. But do you know what the problem is? That he's in here all right in every one of you, but nobody, I mean every one of you have that Christ dwelling in you. But are you conscious of that? When you get up in the morning, are you conscious Christ is there. When you have a problem and something goes wrong, where is your Christ? Is he there? Yes. Why is it that so many times we get so afraid of the future and sometimes we have fear even of the present? This is a brother... Larry was telling you about three months ago I was uh, well I wasn't exactly in a wheelchair but I should have been I refused to use it because I said if you get me in one of those uh, it's going to be harder for me to get out so I'm not even going to get into it so I didn't but I want to tell you I was pretty well crippled I was just about and uh, here I am uh, this itinerary was coming up in the United States and my wife kept saying you won't be able to go to the United States like this I said I know that but I said I'm not going to be like this when I go to the United States <laughs> oh through a whole series of things and, and by the grace of God here I am and the doctor said well uh, we can fix it all right for you we can fix your problem. It was a specialist uh, that I happened to, uh, was a brother to a doctor that I knew. And he was a, a specialist, a back specialist. So I said, well, to my wife, I said, uh, let's see what's, what this is about because I hadn't got any answer from God just at that point. So he examined me and got some x-rays and so on and said, Oh, yes, it's, uh, yes, you've got a problem with your spine. And uh, the, the cord that goes down through the center of the spine 
is being crushed at a certain point. And that's where all your problems coming from. Well, I said, what, do you, what can you do about that? He said, oh, we can operate, there's no problem. He said, we can fix it. I said, how much would that cost? Well, that was thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And I said, well, sir, I'm just sorry, but I don't have that kind of money. So he asked me what I did, and I told him, I said, well, I, you know, I said, I just go around and tell a few people some nice things and some things that change their lives and help them and encourage them and so on. Oh, he said, you do that. Well, when I was walking out, of course, you got a, a doctor in Australia, a specialist like that, that's $200 just for one hour. So I said to the girl on the counter as I was just going out, I said, um, how much do I owe the doctor? She said, just a minute, I go and ask him. So she went away and come back and said, the doctor said that'll be all right, Mr. Walter, don't worry about it. Well, I said, thank you, Lord. Well, there was no way in the world that I could have had that operation. And that was good because I didn't know I wanted the Lord to fix it anyway. But you know, I mean, I have to be honest with you, sometimes it's, it's, it really takes some getting down to the reality of life and to discover this consciousness which is in the spirit world. See, do you realize that it doesn't matter where you are in this world and what situation you're in, it doesn't matter because God's there. Yeah. Yeah. But you've got to be conscious of it. Yeah. Yeah. You hear this? If you can be conscious of his presence wherever you are, when everything's gone wrong and you know that everything's gone wrong, but if you have the consciousness that Christ is there with you, hey, everything's okay. And he is. He is everywhere. Yes. And of course he's everywhere where you go because you take him with you. Yeah. He dwells in you. Amen. So this, this uh, verse here in uh, Revelation 3.20 is saying to me and to you, that Jesus Christ dwells in you, that's a fact. We're not debating that at all. But what we are understanding from this verse is that he does not have access into your life. Uh-huh. He doesn't have access into the center out of which you live your life. Somebody's knocking on the door and says, I want to come in and we're going to have a cup of coffee together. Or tea if you come from England. <laughs> you see, he's not coming in to give us a lecture. He's not coming in to try and teach us something. He's coming in to fellowship with us. Why? Because you know what changed my life? It is a sense of his presence yes. within me. Yes. And that's what will change your life. In any given situation, if you're on your own in that situation, like the doctor says, well, I'm sorry, sir, or lady, you know, but you've got cancer. Now, if you don't have what we're talking about here tonight, if you don't have a spiritual consciousness I mean, that's going to rip you apart. That's just going to tear you up. But if you have a consciousness of that Christ dwelling in you at that very moment, with all of his power, he can just open his hand and feed every living creature in the universe. That's all he has to do. He can feed 5,000 people with five little savages. Come on. This is the reality. If that is your consciousness, hey, everything's okay. Everything's fine. But see, because our consciousness has simply been in this natural world, then when something happens, you can't find God. Why? Because He's not out there in this natural world. He's in here. 
is in that other world. That other world is not a million miles away from us. It's not way up above the starry sky. That other world, if you put your hand out, you are touching that other world. Right. <laughs> it's right here. Right. In fact, you're standing in it if you can only understand because the Christ, the Christ of God, is in that He is spirit. Yes. <clears throat> and in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says, God said, let us make man. And there's the man. And that man was pure spirit. And you were in that man. Every one of you, you are in that man. See? That means you are spirit. Now, if you take a fish and take it out of the water, it doesn't last very long. It takes about three gasps of, of breath out here, and it just about says, that's it, and that's the end. It dies. Why? Because it's out of its environment. It can only live in the water. But see here, we can only live in the spirit world. Or else we're going to live in this world out of our mortality. But the Apostle Paul said, this mortal must put on immortality. It must. Why? Because if it doesn't put on immortality, then it's going to have to part company with the Christ that's inside. And if you have to go by way of the grave, and I'm not going to judge anybody if you have to do that, but all I know is this, that your body is not you, and it's just going to go back to the dust down there, but the Christ has never left that other world. And that's who you are. There's no dead people, beloved. There's no dead people, I said. They're all alive. But then, of course, John 5, 24 tells me, he said, He that hears my voice, and believes into the Christ or into the Father that sent me, he will have, not will get, but have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed, is passed from death unto life. Are you going to die? Are you going to die? Oh, Christians say to me, no, I'm not going to die, I've got eternal life. I say, you, you really got eternal life? Yes. I said, how do you know? Well, because, you know, one day I'm going to die. I said, what? You're going to die? You just told me you had eternal life. <laughs> and you're going to die. Yeah, I die, but the, when I die, then I'm going to heaven. Oh, God help us. How confused can we be? But I'm not judging anybody because I believed that once. I learned the cross and I haven't done it for 40 years now because that was all what men told me. Well, he said he's knocking at the door and says, I want to come in and I want to share my life with you. Now, there's something about God which is very wonderful. Everything that God touches becomes something that is part of God. Everything that God touches. So, everything that God says becomes reality. So, if He comes and he is knocking at, at a door inside here and says, I want to come into your 
everyday life. I want this body to become my body. The body of Christ. That's what I want. But you're not, going, you're not letting me in. You see? You keep me in a little box up here. Just up in the top of your head somewhere. It's called the carnal mind. And that carnal mind has no ability to know God at all. In fact, Paul says in Romans 8 that it is an enemy of God. Lord, help us tonight. It's an enemy of God. So, living out of this natural mind actually makes us to become a living soul. Not just the women here, but everybody, the men as well. Right. We become a living soul when the calm mind is controlling this body. Let me tell you one thing more. If you have sickness in your body today, it has come because the carnal mind is in control of your body. <clears throat> the kingdom of God, which has been deleted from the church's um, understanding and involvement, they have basically passed that off. They don't believe in the kingdom of God except to say that maybe someday, one day, you know, after the ages are all over and everything, then God might start to build his kingdom. When Jesus Christ came into this world, he began by preaching the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of salvation. Yes. And he said to his people, uh, to his disciples, he said, I want you to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom and heal the sick. He told them that way back in, in the beginning of Matthew there. That's what he told them. What about us? Well, how many people have healed the sick? How many of us know how to do that? We think, oh, no, you've got to be some special person, you know. You've got to have at least, you know, 50 years of experience and preaching and so on, understanding of the Bible. I want to tell you a child, and I have seen children do it. Children in a playground. And so one of their little mates has got asthma or something. And so one of those girls just puts her hand on them and just sets them free. They can do it. Why? Because they don't have all the crazy knowledge that we have that we think is reality, but it's not. It's religion. And religion just bombs us up. So he's knocking at the door and says, I want to come in now. I want to come into that part of you where, where your life begins to flow from. It's like the headquarters, if you like. And the Apostle Paul, he speaks about that in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it was not robbery to be equal with God. Paul, are you crazy? You want, you want us to have that mind in here? And Paul says, yes, why not? If Christ is in there, surely his mind should also be there. I mean, he has his own mind. Did you know that? You thought he was running on yours, didn't you? <laughs> How can he run on your mind when you don't even believe in spiritual consciousness? Lord help us. What does the spiritual mind say? That I am equal with God. Why? Because your identity is Christ. And what did Jesus Christ say? I and my Father are one. Did you hear that? 
the Christ in you and the Father are one. And, P and Philip said to him one day, Lord, you've been doing a lot of wonderful things here and you've talked about your Father and telling us how wonderful he is. Now if you would just show us the Father, we'll be happy. <laughs> and Jesus looked at Philip and said, Philip, you mean to tell me I've been all this time with you and you've never known me? You don't know the Father? He said, if you've seen me, the Christ in you, and the one in whom the Christ is, you have seen the Father. Lord, help us tonight. So he's knocking on that door. He wants to come in. And that mind says, he thought it not a thing to be grasped at, to be equal with God. Why? Because Christ is my identity. Christ is your identity. And if Christ is your identity, he's already said, you're one with the Father. We're not trying to be like God. We're not trying to act like God. We're not trying to do what God does. That's a waste of time. I write to many pastors that write to me from India and Africa and different countries like that. Many, many pastors write to me. And they tell me, you know, God has called us to the ministry and we're in this little village and we're preaching the gospel and telling people how to get saved. And sometimes we have a, you know, a few baptisms and we're really doing things for God. And brother, we need your help. <coughs> Because our children haven't got enough to eat and you know we haven't got enough money to buy Bibles for the people and so on and so on would you help us? I said hey there's something wrong here you mean to tell me that God says I want you to go out and do all this work for him but he says I can't pay you you're just gonna have to beg you know for the money I said I don't know who that God is my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills he owns the cattle of a thousand hills and the gold and silver in every land. <laughs> He's not short. He's not short at all. I can tell you that 40 years of ministry and I have never sold a thing. And I was in the church in Washington, D.C. Quite a big church and the pastor's wife said to me, how much are your books? I said, they're free. She said, you mean to say you give them all away? I said, yes. She said, how do, you, how do you finance your ministry? I said, I don't. I said, Father takes care of that. <laughs> and she just kind of looked at me. She said, I said, I don't sell any CDs. And I said, there are hundreds and maybe thousands over the year go out. And I said, they're free. And I said, you can get onto my website. And I said, you can download all the books and you can down download the, the CDs and DVDs and so on. She said, how in the world can you make your living? Well, I said, I don't have any problem with my living. The government pays that. <laughs> I get a pension because I'm over 50. You know, I think. 